This program is brought to you by Emory University. On September 27, 2013, the Center for Faculty Development and Excellence at Emory University hosted a discussion titled Graduate Students and Public Scholarship. The panelists explored the opportunities, potential risks, and ethical dimensions for graduate students who take their work into the public realm, as well as strategies for pursuing public scholarship. The speakers were David Lynn, Asa Griggs Candler Professor in Chemistry and Biology, Peggy Barlett, Goodrich C. White Professor of Anthropology, and Whitney Peoples, Doctoral Candidate in Women's Gender and Sexuality Studies. In this video, Professor Lynn describes and demonstrates how graduate students can communicate their scholarship to the public in creative and compelling ways. When I um, was in college and graduate school, I guess the way I put this into perspective for me was college uh, was largely about learning uh, how to think. Uh, and my liberal arts education was spectacular because I learned, I was able to take courses in music and religion and history and political science and the sciences. I ended up, I ended up, ended up in the sciences, but that diversity of perspective was very valuable to me because I learned how to evaluate evidence from different perspectives, how to make arguments. Uh, uh, and it was a spectacular experience, and I thought that there was nothing else to do but to go to graduate school after that. And graduate school, for me, at least at the time, was, uh, was a, a different transition. It was about um, uh, learning how to be creative, learning how to take that ability to make arguments and formulate it in a very personal way, uh, to express my own perspective and my own creativity in different ways. And that, that uh, has certainly been a major part of what I did in, in graduate school and what I, what I continue to do after that. Um, but, but that model, I would argue, uh, is built on the notion that in college, uh, it was all about access to information. And universities provided a unique opportunity for access to information and people who were processing that information and how to think about making arguments. Uh, and I would say that today that pressure has changed. Uh, access to information is much more freely available than it was in the past. And the universities don't have the unique opportunity to provide that access to information any longer. Uh, so as a result of that, college, I think, is changing, and the opportunities in college are changing. And part of the way they're changing is to move the, I would argue, is to move the benefits of graduate school, uh, about a very individual experience about how to be creative, more into the college experience. <clears throat> and that leaves a question of what graduate school is and what it does, and how is it prepares you for going forward. Uh, so, in thinking about that, the Howard Hughes Award that I got uh, really allowed me to think about ways of interfacing really undergraduate and graduate education. That's what it was. And, and the process in order, as Whitney can tell you, is, is about empowering graduate students to come in and teach about their creative science, their discoveries, their findings in a way uh, that will impact freshmen uh, coming into college and trying to understand for them what college is about in the fall. And then in the spring, they do the same thing. They do it uh, to graduating seniors. So it's meant to focus at the two transition points in college and to take advantage of the perspective that graduate, school, graduate students have about trying to express their own creativity and empowering undergraduates in that process, both before college and as they transition out of college. So that was the context. Now, order as it started, uh, in my mind, uh, was largely about what I knew about, and that was working in a laboratory. And I'll just put that into some perspective, because I think that's going to be important in what I say about order and where I go from there. Uh, a laboratory. Uh, as it's currently constituted, is a marvelous system, an inter interactive, cooperative system between uh, graduate students and faculty members and undergraduates, where they work together to struggle with 
trying to understand what we know and trying to put that pers- into perspective about what we don't know and designing, at least in the sciences, designing experiments to try to test and move that knowledge base forward. Uh, but what makes it so much fun and what makes it the best job I can imagine is, is the interactive system in which it operates. Uh, everyone's free to express an idea and to have an idea for an experiment and to argue about it and to try to find the best experiment to be done that will advance this information as quickly as possible. Uh, And it's because of that interactive system is what makes it so special. Order tries to do the same thing but on a a larger scale. It has five teacher scholars that are teaching together in one class. And they depend on each other and what they teach, for example, to the freshmen to build their scholarship on and to put it into some perspective. And the most, for me, the most fun part of the order program is to watch five people coming from very different disciplines, from women's studies and religion to physics and math to political science to biomedical engineering, to try to find the common thing that ties them together, that allows them to build up scholarship in different disciplines to be able to explain what they have found or what their discoveries are in the context of something which, to first approximation, the intelligently public could understand, which are represented by the freshmen, by the seniors. So I would say that that is now the position that graduate education is in, is in a position not just to nurture the creativity of the individual, but to broaden that out to capture people in different disciplines with different perspectives. The order class, for me, is a great experiment on teaching someone how to do that because you're you're given the challenge of developing a course, defining a course, defining the title, defining the theme of that course that requires different disciplines to come together because each of the five people come from different disciplines to create some coherent message to entering freshmen as to what college is about and what their future might be. And the rewarding part of that is seeing the graduate students come to terms with what that, what that is. So how can this manifest itself, this, these lessons, I guess, that I've learned from the benefit of being able to run the, to run the order class? Uh, for me, it's, it's also translated into ways that we can reach out to the public. And I feel like we're at a time, at a place, where the, one of the challenges that we face is uh, about the critical evaluation of evidence. How do we understand evidence? How do we make arguments about evidence? How do we use that evidence to make creative arguments individually, collectively, about where we're going? Um, so, for me, one of the critical things that I study or I'm passionate about is understanding evolution, which is probably the best tested theory that we have of all of our theories, and yet it's the one that is least understood or least supported by the public at large. And I see it as representative of uh, the the concepts of scientific theories that we operate under. We have uh, theories of structure and bonding, we have theories of gravity, we have theories that are much less tested than evolution, and, and, and yet it is evolution that 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 challenges the social structure that we currently have. And so how can you find a way, find a dialogue, to reach out to the public largely, not just within the university, but largely to answer or to create a dialogue about the theory of evolution? Um, so I've got a video, if I can find it here. Close that tab. Uh, that, that is an example of one of these uh, efforts to reach out to the public. It's a flash mob. Uh, it's not something that you actually get academic credit for in the U.S., <laughs> but it's something that's fun and engaging and has the potential to make a difference, I think. Uh, and I'll, I'll let you be the judge of that to some extent, but, it's, uh, but it is an important part of, I think, what scholarship is and what scholarship is becoming, is finding ways of reaching out to the community that we live in within an academic institution, but using that platform, that ability to look at problems in multiple different ways to reach out to the community at large, particularly at a time when technology is moving so rapidly and it's difficult to even understand the cell phone that we all operate under. And and in that context, the technology can be scary. So it's very important that we reach out and we be precise about how we understand this and what this means and how we evaluate questions 
that arise all the time. So this is an opportunity uh, that I've used to try to find a way of creating dialogue. Group Intelligence, a science and art experiment in public places. During Group Intelligence, participants walk, run, solve problems, laugh, and build something extraordinary together. In Group Intelligence, people download MP3 tracks in advance, or they borrow one. They all arrive in the same, that same location at exactly the same time. We press play at the same time, and we go on an epic adventure together through a city. Are you ready? Yeah! yeah. Let me go! Five, four, Run. Run. Run in any direction. Keep running. Good. Stop. You are alone. You are matter. Molecules. Walk in any direction. Already. You might feel compelled to self-assemble, waiting to come together. Keep walking until everyone is circling together. During group intelligence, the audience both creates and experiences images of chemical evolution and the emergence of life. While the audience follows the narration, their movements mimic the self-assembly patterns of molecules how life begins. The event draws parallels between groups of people and groups of molecules. In both, individual behaviors of selfishness or cooperation create a collective intelligence. Scientists are now studying how this very property allowed the molecules of early Earth to self-assemble to form life. This time when you hear the sound, you are going to start singing a song. It doesn't matter what song it is or how self-conscious you feel. You'll have 45 seconds to have everyone singing the same song. Ready? In working with the Center for Chemical Evolution, we discovered this fascinating research they're working on. The traditional Darwinian theory of survival of the fittest isn't the whole story. That what's true at a molecular level, and that translates into a human level, is that survival really depends on diversity. For humans, the chemical diversity, the diversity of ideas, the diversity of societies, and the diversity of life on Earth are all critical for our survival. Once they become public knowledge, once those ideas spread out into the public mind, are going to transform the way that we think about ourselves as human beings. The audience in the final phase of the experiment can actually have a conversation with each other. They can talk with the artists, they can talk with the scientists, they can talk with each other and talk about the concepts and the experiences and the frustrations that they had. Have an opportunity to sort of express with each other the differences in the way that they experienced it. And I think you can learn a lot when you do that. The preceding program is copyrighted by Emory University.